I'm Carl Smith. Good morning. And this is AIDS 2024 live daily kickoff show brought to you by the International AIDS Society and Plus Life, coming to you live from the epicenter of the world's largest conference on HIV and AIDS, the Global Village, right here in Munich. It has been an action packed 24 hours. And there's still a lot more to come from AIDS 2024. We'll get to all of that, of course. And coming up, I'm excited to have a panel of esteemed guests joining me to discuss the topic of science, doctors, and putting people first. But right now, let's take a look at some of the biggest news from the last 24 hours here at AIDS 2024. Yesterday, we told you about HIV science for the future, the topic of a special session attended by some of the world's most renowned scientists. Together, these experts shared their views of where HIV science must be heading. If you have a population that is increasingly sexually healthy and active, we really have to figure out how we're going to figure out the STI portion. We also heard from a panel that asked the question, what's preventing us from preventing? How do we integrate this message, this life-saving message, and move it from a, a hashtag of solidarity to really a commitment of progress and policy? Meanwhile, activist and creator of I'm a Beautiful Story, Doreen Moracha from Kenya, gave important insights into how we can harness the power of social media to fight HIV stigma. The internet is a very chaotic place sometimes, mm. but there are good parts of the internet. There are good parts of uh, digital spaces and uh, leveraging on them, using them, reaching people through them. And that is not just uh, local, it's a whole global audience you have. And it was the AIDS 2024 co-chair's choice with some exciting results of a new study done to test the efficacy of a twice yearly injectable HIV prevention drug was shared. The results of the Purpose One study herald in an exciting chapter in HIV prevention, especially in sub-Saharan Africa, where it comes when it comes to long-lasting injectable PrEP. Now, earlier this week, I caught up with Ambassador Dr. John McKingerson from PEPFAR to get his reaction from the study and how, along with PEPFAR's continued work around the world, what he feels must still be done to ensure that we can end HIV and AIDS. Thus far, how's the conference going in your mind? Great conference. Let me just say this. All HIV conferences are great conferences because it's a huge platform for, to remind us that the fight against HIV AIDS is not over and that uh, there are still uh, millions of people that get infected every year. Uh, despite our remarkable progress, we still have remarkable challenges ahead of us. As it stands today, and I think you've touched on it a bit there, but what do you really see are the biggest challenges? The biggest challenges are a couple. One is that the political visibility that used to characterize HIV AIDS. When HIV AIDS was ugly, the, uh, we went to hospitals around the world and saw skeleton of people with thin flesh over their body lying there. It brought home the message. It brought out the humanity in us of care. So we did something. And because we, we were very successful, we became vulnerable, politically vulnerable to, to that success, where the political leadership doesn't see HIV AIDS as a, a, as a part. It has fallen one notch down. So that's why, as I said earlier, <clears throat> these conferences are a reminder that that is not gone. Second is financial. Uh, the physical space in the world is very limited, very tight. Uh, competing priorities, the war in, 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 in Ukraine, in the Middle East and other parts of the world, uh, climate change and other priorities are a challenge. HIV, uh, we just can't wish HIV away. Right. We need resources, we need funding to make HIV, to, uh, uh, to fight HIV. Thirdly is the segregation discrimination and bad laws, simply put bad laws and bad policies that uh, segregate, discriminate, stigmatize and criminalize mm. people, especially key populations. We have to break down those barriers and build bridges of relationships and confidence and not be walls that stand between us and the ability to fight the virus.
It is always a pleasure to get to spend time with Ambassador Nakenga Song and, uh, of course, find out all the important work that PEPFAR does. Uh, now, in speaking of important work, there is so much more to come from AIDS 2024. Here's a look at some of the upcoming events that we think you should know about. Ambassador Dr. John Nakengasong from PEPFAR will deliver his keynote speech on why we must take responsibility and leadership towards ending HIV. There is segregation, discrimination and bad laws, simply put bad laws and bad policies that uh, segregate, discriminate, stigmatize and criminalize people, especially key populations. And all week, HIV science as art has been on exhibit in the Brain Lab Tower, a groundbreaking exhibition merging the talents of 12 artists living with HIV and 12 scientists from across the globe. The artworks will be auctioned with money raised going to fund projects supporting the HIV communities in Eastern Europe. It's really important to um link, uh, make this link between art and science. The Global Village will once again be a hive of activity, especially around a debate engaging participants about disclosing their HIV status in the U equals U era. It is such a cool concept, taking the science of HIV and merging it into art. And I love that the funds being raised are going towards a great cause as well. Now, speaking of science, today's roundtable discussion focuses on science as well as doctors and putting people first. Joining me now is Miwash Parczewski, I hope I got it right, Miwash, Perfect. from the Pomeranian <laughs> Medical University in Poland, and Melanie Ott from the University of California, UCSF. Thank you both for being here this morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, we're almost towards the end of the conference. How has it been thus far for both of you? Amazing. Yeah? Amazing. I thought it's an amazing energy, an amazing focus, and um, really interesting results. The location is also great. We are having it in, the, in Germany, but looking toward Eastern Europe, where majority of epidemics in Europe is now. So also from the perspective of, of where IAS has brought the conference, this is a great venue. Yeah, I, and Eastern Europe is, it, it is such an area that needs important focus. Today I want to sort of get your perspective as, from a scientist's point of view and from a medical practitioner's point of view on the theme of the conference, which is putting people first. Melanie, we're hearing a lot about person-centered care this week. What does that look like from a scientist's perspective? Um, well, I don't think it means a lot, lot, a lot different, something different from, from another perspective, I, but I think it's a really important refocus for scientists to put people first, um, because sometimes when you're in the lab, and you work with all you know the molecules and the and the scientific questions you forget the people and I think this is a very important um, reminder for us um, to make sure that what we are doing is serving just one cause which is you know helping people and um, and that's it and so for me it's a it's a very important and very powerful um, message do you feel that that message is getting through and being received by the scientific community here at the conference yes absolutely i think the scientific community especially um, though the the scientific community centered on hiv is very is very close to people in general much closer i would say than other scientific areas um, because um, the community is very close to us, I think we all have um, close interactions with community um, and, um, and, um, and it's actually a very, powerful, um, a very powerful message for us that we can give to our young scientists. Mm -hmm. And we hear this all the time, especially from our trainees, that having this connection and having this center is really incredibly motivating for them. And so I think this, this, um, this uh, this focus at this meeting um, is really hitting the mark. What about you, Miwash, as far as uh, from a medical standpoint, when we talk about uh, person-centered care, how does that look from your perspective? So obviously we are looking into putting people first for some time, but there is never enough reminder and progress in this respect. So uh, we are still looking how to best fit the therapy, the optimized concomitant treatments, uh, optimized starting use, optimized uh, person-centered care towards 
people who live with HIV and will be living for years and we expect a young person to live 50, 40, 60 years sometime. So we really need to refocus not only on antiretroviral treatment but the entirety of medical conditions but also psych psychological, uh, social and integrate this care and this is what this conference is emphasizing and what is happening here is we are also refocusing clinicians to think not only on the small share which is antiretroviral treatment but to expand to various issues and you have seen uh, wonderful presentations on migration on stigma which is still there and we could even level the stigma from political stigma, uh, political system stigma to very low individual stigma. This is also very important for the people on the move when you encounter new environment, new medical system, but also new home. So you need to integrate that. Also for me, a very special thing here was that we are talking about person-centered approach from the people perspective who is already living with uh, HIV, but also people-centered approach, approach for populations at risk of mm -hmm. HIV acquisition and uh, actually expanding science towards voices of communities of people who are helping to design clinical preventive trials for various populations across the world uh, and vulnerable populations, female populations, uh, people who inject drugs and uh, transgender uh, people. So this is also something that struck me during this conference. So you can have people-centered approach for people who live with right. HIV, but also for all the populations at risk of well, uh, getting infected. As we always, I always say, HIV and AIDS affects everyone, not just those of us living with it. I'm, I'm curious, this is really an opinion question for you both. Does it surprise you that after over 40 years, we still have such stigma around HIV and AIDS? Yeah, so this is a difficult question, yeah. um, but I, I would say um, it is something that we have to continuous ta continuously tackle. Um, I think um, we think that we have made amazing progress, but we all know that there are still areas where we have to really work on. Um, and it is very sad, but, uh, but I think it is something that we will probably continuously be working on to make sure that we don't fall back into dark times. Yeah, I mean, that's why I, I'm, I'm like, the more you talk about it, the more you say HIV, the more we, uh, you know, people like myself who are living with HIV are open about it, the less frightening, I guess, it becomes, right? Certainly. But also you have to look into the world. I'm coming from the um, society, from a region where the stigma levels are higher mm. than the rest of Europe. So the stigma index is actually increasing from west and south of Europe to center and the east. So it's also much more difficult to get a message on uh, work with HIV, live, living with HIV and actually appropriate prevention to go through and actually what I was saying is we start with a political system then you've got more individual level to a person level so you have to work at many levels and sometimes you struck a barrier at this very top level mm -hmm. so you do not get any support or the support is difficult sometimes when political system change uh, it's easier to get through this happened to us uh, in the last year but our uh, government has changed towards a little bit more open, progressive, and uh, I hope the stigma will decrease. Yeah, well, we all do. Um, I, big results yesterday, the results of the Purpose One study, which is looking at long-lasting uh, injectable prep, yeah, a tw twice a year, in, you know, injection. Um, the results from the study are rather phenomenal. They were, you know, almost unbelievable, really. Um, again, it's, it's an opinion I'm asking for, really, but when we are at a point where you see results like that, that show, you know, 100% efficacy, uh, is the search for a vaccine still important? If we've got tools like PrEP that, and, and this particular long-lasting injectable, that you get your shot twice a year, and it's showing, for now, at least 100% efficacy. 
Um, very difficult question. Yes, I, think I know. I, I love the results. Yeah. I think it's it's a wonderful victory of you know science and and research and 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 hard work of everybody. Um, um, I'm particularly connected to it because PrEP was you know first uh, rolled out and 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 tested at the Gladstone Institute mm -hmm. where I work, um, and so I I really think that this is an, an amazing tool that we have now and that we should use to the fullest. Um, as a scientist and as a virologist, um, I would say we should still give the vaccine a trial mm. and, and, and uh, because there has been so much work been done in there and we have been learning so much about it through the work in HIV but also in other viruses most recently with SARS-CoV-2 um, that I think we should, um, we should not give up on it because at least potentially a subpopulation might benefit from it or we might get it to a, um, to a level where it might be cheaper and easier to apply and more long lasting so that you don't have to re reapply it every six months or, um, or, or more frequently, um, which could help um, particularly certain people who are not accessible in, um, in, in that manner. So I, I as a scientist, um, would have a hard time to give up on the vaccine. Yeah, well, that's a, an important point of view. Meanwhile, I'm, I'm curious, what do you think there goes, this is the fun. I'm going to pick that up as we go live. That's your microphone there. And, and if, I, if it drops, I can't hear you. So I think the joys of live going live. Uh, Miwash, question for you. What is the, um, what does the world without HIV look like, do you think? Oh, that's an amazingly difficult question. I uh, ask the challenging questions, and I know it's early, so I'm sorry <laughs> to be testing your, your amazing we brains are... at this hour. Okay, so... World without HIV would need to fill certain conditions. Mm -hmm. So purpose study is giving us one. So uh, we would need to have a fully 100% effective prophylaxis for people at risk. Uh, and actually vaccine uh, question is adding to that because we are also speaking about choices in mm -hmm. prevention. So there will be choice uh, in uh, uh, prevention uh, prep wise we are speaking about combination prevention we cannot stop uh, from uh, uh, at HIV only we need to think about STIs and a uh, variety of uh, issues related to sexual health and then for people living with HIV uh, you need uh, like a miracle drugs which we do maybe not um, we do have drugs which are highly efficacious, but uh, if we were talking about a magic wand solution, let's call it like that, uh, you would need a drug with no safety issues mm -hmm. and with 100% uh, uh, acceptance and allowing for 100% uh, uh, adherence. And we are going there also with long-acting injectables. So this, the world is progressing towards it and the cure. Uh, the cure research is the key to the world without HIV. We have seen the patient uh, from Berlin, the mm -hmm. second ba Berlin patient, uh, actually, which also calls for progress in that. We have seen that it is uh, possible also to have cure uh, with only one CCR5 Delta 32 uh, allele. So it means that the pool of possible people who may be donors uh, for the transplant might be larger, but we still need a breakthrough in this respect. This is a still um, focused on a very minimal population, so we need new pathways mm. toward cure, toward elimination of HIV in people who already are living with this virus. Yeah, well, and, and it's down to the hard work of folks like you that keep pushing for that so that people like me living with HIV can live full, happy, healthy lives. So uh, Melanie Miwash, thank you very much for making time to chat with us this morning. Uh, that is all the time we've got for this morning's AIDS 2024 Live Daily Kickoff Show presented by uh, Plus Life and the International AIDS Society. We're going to be back bright and early tomorrow for our final day here. Where did the time go at AIDS 2024? And we'll sit down with those who have attended and get their thoughts and main takeaways on this year's conference. Now, remember, if you want to share your thoughts on the conversation that we just had or anything else to do with the conference, check out our social media pages. We are at Plus Life Media across all social platforms, and you can use the hashtag AIDS2024 Plus Life. For myself and everybody else here at the team, 
Thanks for watching. We'll see you tomorrow.